thought this might have been your father? I don't. You know, I, I have to say, uh, Michael Cohen had to have seen this coming. Um, this, you know, all of a sudden he's, you know, a liar and a cheat. Paul Manafort doesn't even exist uh, at, at this point. I mean, he was the... Uh, the Trump, you mean? Yeah, yeah he Trump. was that guy who was he, around for a couple weeks. He was that guy who was sort of there. Yeah. I mean, no one really knew his name. Sam? Sam Manafort? Is that his name? <laughs> I mean, seriously, they, they've done this with other people, with the exception of Michael Flynn. He's someone they still acknowledge is on this earth. That said, everyone else who, is, who has gotten in trouble, who has crossed them, who seems to have flipped, out the door. Well, they don't have any public knowledge, at least public knowledge. They may know privately what Flint has told the special counsel. That's true, That's but I, I mean in the their public statement. Loyalty exists. And loyalty, yeah. loyalty still exists because they have no, at least there's no public evidence that Flint has given damning information about the president himself. I'm sorry, go ahead. So for, first, happy anniversary of the president uh, asking Russia if they can find um, Hillary's emails. Um, but also, I think at least as important as um, Cohen saying the president had advanced knowledge. Um, is the fact that he says others can corroborate this story, and that's right. that's very important. And what and, and it goes back to what we don't know about what Bob Mueller knows. Does he have documented evidence? That, can he already essentially corrob corroborate what he's what he's claiming? I think that's every bit of it. And I also I, I want to point out, Michael Cohen has stage managed this kind of in an interesting way. In his interview with George Stephanopoulos, he very conspicuously declined to say whether the president knew about this meeting, and then he's been sort of tiptoeing ever closer to this line, and now he's finally sort of given this apparently given this reveal. Uh, and to your point about uh, Michael Cohen says there are others who knew. Uh, we know the special counsel has been at this for months. I will give you one name that I think is central to this and many other of these unresolved questions. Hope Hicks, who was at the president's side uh, throughout the campaign when these things, when the meeting was happening, who was at the president's side on Air Force One when they had the phone call with Donald Trump Jr. to about issuing a statement to the New York Times that was not factually correct, if you will. Again, if, this, if, if your memory is a little blurry on this because so many things happen in this investigation and in this administration, June 2016. Donald Trump Jr. takes a meeting with Russians who promised dirt on Hillary Clinton. Several other top campaign, Paul Manafort included, Jared Kushner included, are brought into the meeting. This has been asked about a lot of times. Who knew about it in advance? Did the president know about it in advance? Here's a little bit of the history. When did the president learn that that meeting had taken place? Uh, I believe in the last couple of days, is my understanding. Did you tell your father anything about this? No. Uh, it was such a nothing. There was nothing to tell. Let's focus on what the president was aware of. Nothing. The president was not aware and did not attend this meeting. He said he has no, had no meetings, was aware of no meetings with uh, Russians, was not aware of this one until uh, really right before it all broke. And that's uh, what the president has said. Did you know at the time that they had the meeting? No, I didn't know anything about the meeting. I mean, there is zero wiggle room here for the president. This is not one of those things where he meant this. If it turns out that Cohen's telling the truth now and that there's others who can corroborate that and the president do know about it in advance, uh, there's no way to wiggle out of that one. So the question to me sort of is what's the worst case scenario for the question, uh, uh, for the president, excuse me. Um, you know, let's say he did have advanced knowledge of this meeting and it's proven indisputably. So the president's caught in a lie, his lawyers are caught in a lie, his children are caught in a lie. Uh, that's happened quite a few times before. Um, collusion is not a, a criminal offense. And so I sort of wonder, you know, what will the upshot of that be? And that, I think, is sort of an interesting question to ponder. Um, the president can't be indicted for that. He can be impeached for it. But I, I do sort of wonder whether um, it, House Republicans or if Democrats take over after November will move to impeach the president for having advanced knowledge of a meeting that we're not quite sure whether anything came out. And, of. and also the way that it came out and whether or not the president tried to essentially cover up what happened. We know that he dictated that statement uh, all on Air Force One about when the New York Times first reported about on this. They initially denied that he had any role whatsoever. The White House uh, and Jay Sekulow also denied that, and it turns out that he did dictate that statement. So, I mean, it goes to the president did know about this ahead of time, and he they denied that. Maybe you know. This, right. So how does this fit into the bigger story and the other potential mistruths, distortions, right. and the like? I think it's the bigger question here, but still dramatic to see. Just to your point, Michael Cohen's evolution, shall we call it, uh, in recent days. Up next for us, big economic news that should boost the president and the Republican Party. But what does it mean for your wallet? As the press reports, the economy grew at a 4.1 percent rate last quarter the fastest growth rate since 2014. The president quickly adding a White House event to celebrate. He says his big tax cut and his war on regulations are big reasons. The big question is, can this boom last? Seeing as Christine Romans first breaks down the numbers. 
John, the American economy roared back in the spring from its first quarter lull. It was the strongest quarter since 2014 when the economy grew 5.2 percent under President Obama. President Trump says this quarter was not an anomaly. In fact, he is promising three plus percent annual GDP growth for the year. As the trade deals come in one by one, we're going to go a lot higher than these numbers. And these are great numbers. These numbers are very, very sustainable. This isn't a one time shot. It would take another two very strong quarters to get there. You know, gross domestic product, John, is the broadest gauge of, of an economy's health. It shows in the second quarter, consumers dug into their pockets. They bought more. A companies invested more in plants, technology, and equipment. The government spent more on defense. This strong quarter reflects an economy in excellent shape. Unemployment is low. Companies are enjoying record profits and lower tax bills. And exports. Exports are surging. In fact, exports rose more than 9 percent. But, John, for an interesting reason, Morgan Stanley says soybean shipments surged some 9,000 percent in a rush of stockpiling before farm tariffs kicked in. The tariff threat boosted exports in the second quarter, but economists expect tariffs to drag on growth after that. The big question now is, can all this hot growth last? The president says it can. But the effects of tax cuts will begin to fade later this year. Higher interest rates could depress consumer spending. The big word today is sustainability. Can this strong growth continue? John? Thank you, Christine. And let's try to answer that question with our panel. Erica Werner is Congressional Economic Policy Correspondent for The Washington Post. Greg Ipp is Chief Economics Commentator for The Wall Street Journal. That is the big question. Uh, this is great news. It's great news for the president. Uh, we'll See if it turns out to be any good news or better news for the Republican Party in a tough election year. But for Americans out there at home, uh, a strong economy is good. Is it as sustainable as the president wants us to believe? Most economists say that it's not. They expect that this quarter, the over 4 percent GDP growth, will not be replicated in the next quarter. But it's important to note, of course, that the timing of this really could not be better for Republicans heading into the midterms. So the next quarter numbers are going to come out just 11 days before the midterms. That won't be enough time to change the narrative, which now is strong economic news. Strong economic news. And as you jump into the conversation, I just want to show this scorecard uh, because, again, the president always says he doesn't get enough credit. Uh, some of this started under Obama. There's no question the tax cuts and the deregulation of the Trump administration have helped. They've added fuel to the fire, if you will. Uh, GDP growth, 4.1 percent for the quarter. Uh, the unemployment rate at 4 percent. Consumer confidence near 14-year high. So whether you voted for the president, whether you're a fan or not, he does have reason to brag today. Absolutely. I mean, yes, the 4.1 percent growth is itself unsustainable. But if you look below the details, you ignore the export stuff. You have consumption growing around 4 percent, very strong growth in business investment. It looks to me like the underlying trend is around 3 percent and that that will continue through the third quarter. Can the president take credit? That's the $65,000 question. The tax cut was supposed to help business investment, and we're getting strong business investment. But maybe a lot of that is just because oil prices are up, and so there's a lot of drilling going on. If you look at some of the other numbers, like how much equipment are people buying, that seems to have actually tapered off a little bit. But these little nuances aren't going to matter much either to the president or to voters. It is still underlying all that, a very good, solid picture. Uh, and just to add a little context, and sometimes the president likes this, sometimes he doesn't, uh, we're going to look at this. This is not, this is a great quarter. The president deserves every right. But we have seen this before. If you go back to the Clinton administration, you had quarters with 7.8 percent growth. George W. Bush administration, 6.9 percent. Obama had a high of 5.2 percent. President's high, this president's high right now, 4.1 percent. The question again is the sustainability. And to the big, to that big question, uh, you heard Christine talk about how some of the soybean exports boom because those farmers were like, okay, the tariffs are coming. Let's get this out of here now. Uh, is there any evidence, or when will we have any evidence of if this trade, call it what you will, skirmish war, will smother the growth? Well, it is very ironic, really, that the trade war, which a lot of uh, corporations and economists are very worried about, in fact, contributed to the strong growth in this quarter because of the stockpiling that Christine was talking about. So, you know, it's difficult to predict where that goes. The deal that the president struck with the European Union, although, you know, we don't know really what it's going to mean. Is that going to be replicated? That kind of came out of nowhere. So those things are hard to predict. It's a deal. It's a, the deal is to talk about a deal. There's, right. no, there's no specific deal. And you heard the president saying when those trade deals come in. Uh, he's been saying that for 18 months. And I would also say that thus far, um, businesses are very worried about the uncertainty about the trade war, but it doesn't seem to have affected their actual behavior yet. Because as the economists keep telling us, the actual numbers don't add up to very much 
in a $20 trillion economy. In terms of the sustainability, I would look elsewhere for things to worry about. One of them is the fact that Obviously, one of the reasons people are spending a lot of money is they just got a big tax cut. Unless they get another big tax cut next year and the year after that and the year after that, that's got to slow down. The second problem is we are running out of people. A big reason that growth has been so strong is we keep adding 200,000 jobs per month. At the rate our population is growing, that is not sustainable, especially if we go ahead and restrict immigration. If you're Jerome Powell.